explosive. These mountains of fire have shaped the history of our planet. Oh, that's just a beautiful spectacle. It's unbelievable. Volcano hunters are risking their lives to understand the awesome power of the Earth. Their quest to unravel the mysteries hidden deep within our planet. more than 1,500 active volcanoes. Millions of lives are at risk. Studying volcanoes is risky work, often close to rivers of molten lava and deadly explosions of hot gas and ash. You want a helicopter up here now? Volcanologists are on the front line. They need to collect samples and record the action from as close as humanly possible. This is extreme science. Before we can accurately predict when volcanoes will erupt, we need to understand how they work. Volcanologist John Seach and cameraman Jeff Mackley are a unique team. They travel the world checking the vital signs of the most dangerous volcanoes. Being on the volcano's edge is a, it's a fascinating place to be. The feeling I get while inside the volcano is one of pure scientific discovery. These two men are about to risk their lives by climbing into an active crater. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. It's, uh, I think we want to go down there. Yeah, but this is the first two uh, are not doing anything. They weren't last night. This third crater seems to be the active one. Two of us seem to complement each other when we go to a volcano. We're both there for the same reason. We love volcanoes, and yet we both do different things. So I go there to record the events. I couldn't see any reason for climbing a volcano if I wasn't actually going to try and film it. Their mission has brought them to an active volcano called Yasur on the South Pacific island of Tama. Yasur doesn't erupt lava flows, it explodes. Giant gas bubbles escape from the molten rock, the magma inside, spewing out lumps of lava called bombs, some as big as 20 feet across. Yasua erupts on average four or five times every hour. John and Jeff are here to collect fresh lava samples for other scientists to analyze back in the laboratory. They're about to descend into one of the most dangerous places on Earth. I think that one came about half an hour too early. Specially made fire suits will protect them from small bombs and temperatures of 1200 degrees. Inside the suits are microphones to help them communicate. This is the first descent ever attempted into Yasua's crater. A major eruption could happen at any time. 
If they are trapped, there will be no escape. The ground is saturated with steam and hot gases. Far too hot to touch with bare hands. I'll stick this probe in now. Let's see what this steaming vent does. 65, 78, 82, 96. Come on, it's got to be 100. John is determined to collect his sample from as close to the active vent as possible. This is the battlefront, where the temperatures are extreme and where huge lava bombs are raining down. The ground is uncomfortably hot here. Just about every rock is smoking here, so I'm not sure what's a fresh bomb or not. not a glowing one, it's probably it's something black and then I won't be able to pick it up in amongst all the other stuff. My spade and try and shift a bit off it. Take it back. See what it can tell us. Whoa. Oh, there it goes. Voila. One freshly ejected yes sir bomb. Fifteen thousand people live in the shadow of your sir. Like all volcanoes, it can kill in a variety of ways. Volcanic ash has turned the drinking water into a poisonous acid. John Seach's duties go beyond sample collection. He also studies Yasser's effects on the local community. He's had to learn the native language, Islama. Tanner's Minister of Health has asked John to take samples of the nearby village's drinking water. Last year, government scientists recommended that locals stop drinking the rainwater. Samples show that ash from recent eruptions had contaminated it. But there are no alternative sources of water, and these villagers are forced to drink the contaminated rain. They're at the mercy of how much ash is spewing out of the volcano. The village chief explains to John that many children and old people are getting sick. Finding good drinking water is almost impossible. In the dry season, we have to go a long way to get water. Some mornings, the children have to go hungry because we have no water for cooking. <laughs> when Yasser does have a major eruption, it will affect more than the few nearby villages. Ash will cover the whole island and force the evacuation of the entire population. The South Pacific is full of explosive volcanoes like you, sir. Cameraman Jeff Mackley has filmed most of them. His film of this eruption of New Zealand's Ruapeyu volcano was shown all over the world. A 
I've had several near-death experiences with volcanoes, one on Mount Ruapehu and one on Mount Etna. The one on Ruapehu, uh, the mountain started erupting while I was up there. The run, guys. Oh, it's the run. Yeah, want a helicopter up here now. Shelter, don't shelter. Space surge over the east We've got a, a large eruption in progress here. Can you get a helicopter up here? Over. All right, I'll wait. Good job, Andy. You got this on film? Without the helicopter, Jeff and the scientists would almost certainly have been killed. We'd just been airlifted down the mountain to safety when it, a, a large explosion happened that showered the whole area that we were in with large rocks and mud. So we would have been probably seriously injured or killed if we'd still been up there. was recently in November, John and I were at Mount Etna inside the crater and a larger than normal explosion happened. We ran away from the camera, left it running, then came back again for a few minutes and it was then that we'd noticed that a rock about the size of a microwave oven had actually landed about two metres behind me but I hadn't noticed that, I was too busy filming. That would have been fatal if it had hit. Time to go! Time to go! Time to go! Bombs are landing! Bombs are over our head! That's enough! This time, John and Jeff escaped unharmed. Other volcano hunters have not been so lucky. For 25 years, a French husband and wife team, Maurice and Katja Kraft, observed and recorded the behavior of volcanoes. They stunned the world with their bravery and the fantastic images they filmed. These two volcanologists witnessed more than 150 eruptions. Mount Bunsen in Japan started to boil over in 1991. The crafts were there, followed by a large group of the world's media, hoping for a big eruption. This is one of the smallest pyroclastic flow I have seen. I hope to see bigger ones than this one, because this is very small, really, yes. I am never afraid, because I have seen so much eruptions in 23 years, that um, <laughs> even if I die tomorrow, I don't care. Prophetic words. The day after this interview, the crafts were killed by a volcano's most deadly weapon, a pyroclastic flow, where the summit of the volcano explodes and then collapses into a billowing cloud of searing hot ash and boulders. Tragically, the two volcanologists greatly underestimated its size. A pyroclastic flow will incinerate anything in its path. It enveloped the crafts and 39 others, mostly cameramen who had followed them up the mountain. This place was once a tropical paradise, a thriving community. 
but pyroclastic flows have devastated the Caribbean island of Montserrat. The volcano that hangs above the ghost town of Plymouth has been exploding every few months for over four years. A dome of solidified magma plugs the top of the volcano. Underneath is new gas-rich magma waiting to be uncorked like a champagne bottle. Montserrat is located in the middle of an island chain of explosive volcanoes that divides the Atlantic Ocean and the Caribbean Sea. In 1996, this island turned into a vision of hell when the volcano burst into life for the first time in 400 years. Massive clouds of gas and rock were thrown high into the air. When they fell back to earth, they roared down the slopes as pyroclastic flows, loaded with millions of tons of burning rock and ash. Every flow has two layers. On top, a billowing mass of hot ash and gas called the surge cloud. underneath a deadly avalanche of giant boulders. years, Plymouth has been terrorized by the volcano. It has forced the evacuation of 8,000 people, two-thirds of the island's population. Montserrat is isolated. Its main link to the outside world was Bramble Airport. One of the pyroclastic flows swept straight through the terminal buildings. Former chief scientist of Montserrat's Volcano Observatory, Professor Steve Sparks, has returned to the island to document the immense forces that occur inside these deadly flows. I'm next to the conveyor belt, which uh, used to bring in my luggage, I remember when I first came to Montserrat, because it was destroyed in the pyroclastic flow of 21st of September 1997. And of course, all you can see now is uh, lumps of rock brought in by the pyroclastic flow. Some of the rocks were the size of a house. Where there were once homes and buildings, there is now only a lunar landscape. We're in the bar area and uh, the uh, hot pyroclastic flow came through here and was so hot that it uh, melted the beer bottles because they've been heated up to perhaps about 400 degrees centigrade. And some of them have even been completely filled with ash from the pyroclastic flow. The heat of the surge cloud above the avalanche is so intense, it can incinerate a whole community in seconds. Some very large pyroclastic flows came down the valley behind us and the billowing surge cloud above the avalanche part of the pyroclastic flow spilled out of the valley and it was still very dynamic and it stripped off the roofs of the houses including this church and uh, set many of them on fire and you can see here that the timbers behind me have been burnt by the surge cloud. The hot debris and gas travelled over the ground at more than 100 miles per hour too fast to escape. Taxi driver Arthur Mead was working close to the volcano when suddenly a surge cloud engulfed his car. I was in this very same car and I just couldn't see. Um, I looked out and there was a lot of fire 
all around the car. I said, well, it's be, it be better for me to come out if the car explodes, then I may not, I may be lucky to get away. So I did. Right now is when you... And I had on a boot with some bobby socks, and the, the, the ash seemed to go up in the air, even though it was so thin, go down on my foot. It did not burn the shoe nor the socks, but it really burned the surface of my, the top of my feet, on both feet. And um, honestly, I've been burned by fire, hot water, matches. I've never felt anything like that. Well, I felt it deep down, like in my innermost part of my, my body. I felt it to the depths of my soul. I've never felt anything so hot. Arthur Meade was lucky. If he'd been nearer to the center of the pyroclastic flow, he would have been incinerated without trace. But not everyone escaped. Despite an evacuation order, 19 people lost their lives. They had returned to the danger zone to tend their farms and livestock and were trapped when a massive flow raced down the mountain. When the victims were recovered, they were found in a pugilistic pose. This strange posture is exactly the same as found in fire victims. Intense heat cooks the muscles, causing them to contract. More evidence that inside a pyroclastic flow, temperatures can reach as high as 400 degrees. Since 1996, the volcano has been constantly active. Most people have left the island, but one man stayed behind. And David Lee lost his business when Montserrat started to erupt. He became obsessed with the volcano and began to make trips up to the crater to capture the action on video. I went up to the crater, actually the crater edge, it was on a Sunday. There was no one around. I couldn't find anybody to go with me, as a matter of fact. I said, well, I'll just grab my camera and I'll run up there and get some shots. And it, as I'm coming over the top of Chance's Peak and walking over the 100 yards to the crater edge, I opened the camera up and said, well, here's what it's like to walk up on the crater. And just as I walked up on the edge, the whole thing <laughs> blows up. It's right in here, you start to hear it. And it makes your heart beat real fast. Anybody watching this? Don't be stupid enough to come up here. This is my last trip, and it's hot already, and it's spewing right now. There's an eruption right now. That's hot stuff going up. It's falling down to this side. I'm not gonna stay long. That's Tar River, she isn't fired up too bad. What you hear there? His rock's coming up, and I'm getting out of here. And it's gonna take a snapshot. And it got real guttural. Here's stuff dropping. It's all over the place behind me. All he could do was race back down the mountain and pray. Right when I walked up to the ridge, she just let loose. Okay, Lord. Put my trust and faith in you. You're my refuge and strength in every trouble. That was my last trip up there, folks. Now do I look scared? I'm not out of here yet. I'm only down about 600 feet. If the whole thing went, wouldn't have a chance up here. I think that's the closest I ever thought about being dead. Unlike the crafts, David Lee escaped. But despite his brush with death, he's continued to film Montserrat's eruptions. I've gotten to know her very well because they, they say they're feminine because they're very, very seductive. And they're always wanting you to come closer. 
because you can get a better view of a pyroclastic flow or an explosion, and that can be dangerous. Sometimes the eruptions are so dense, they turn day into night. I can see the sunlight up ahead, but boy, I'll tell you, it's pitch black there, pitch black there. To get out. It's on the windshield, it's hitting like it did the last time I came up here into Cork Hill. And I would sure like to get out. You can see how heavy a cloud it is. It's actually, you can hear it rock sitting on the roof. Montserrat, the ash also causes another deadly hazard, volcanic mud flows called lahars. When heavy tropical rain falls on ash-laden slopes, it triggers lahars with the consistency of liquid concrete. They will demolish almost anything in their path. Any structures that survive are buried under thick layers of ash and blocks of lava. With every storm, more of the buildings on Montserrat disappear. After four years, the town of Plymouth has all but vanished. But what does the future hold for Montserrat? Will the local residents ever be able to return and reclaim their town? outlook may be bleak. A huge new plug of solidified magma is growing in the crater at an incredible rate of 860,000 tons each day. An ominous sign that in the near future there could be a catastrophic eruption. Seismic tremors detected at Montserrat's volcano observatory reveal that the new magma is creating enormous pressure as it rises up inside the volcano. Nobody knows exactly when, but Montserrat is a time bomb waiting to explode. This volcano also gives off seismic alarms, but a volcanic explosion here will be far more catastrophic than Montserrat. Here, there are more than one million people at risk. This is Vesuvius perched above the Italian city of Naples. Vesuvius is 4,000 feet high and boasts a crater almost half a mile wide. When this volcano explodes, it could take more lives than any other pyroclastic flow in recorded history. Vesuvius sits at the heart of the Mediterranean and is the biggest active volcano on the Italian mainland. One town that has already experienced the full wrath of Vesuvius is Pompeii. 2,000 years ago, its inhabitants died a terrible death. For generations, it was believed that they had been suffocated by volcanic ash. But like the bodies at Montserrat, these are also contorted into the pugilistic pose. Scientists now know they were scorched to death in the searing temperatures of a pyroclastic flow.
one scientist who's been studying the impact of past eruptions on the inhabitants of the Naples area is Andrea Berardi. Vesuvius has been erupting since 25,000 years ago. You've had the major eruption in AD 79, which covered Pompeii and Herculanum, up to the eruption in 1944, where uh, the city of San Sebastiano was overwhelmed by a lava flow and buildings collapsed and people had to uh, flee the town. The last time Vesuvius erupted was in the Second World War. The US Army took these pictures while leading the Allied advance into Italy. By the standards of this volcano, the eruption was small. There were no pyroclastic flows, but it still caused havoc. Thick layers of ash bedded their homes and destroyed the harvest. A river of slow-moving lava crept into the town. Homes that had survived the war now succumbed to the destructive power of the volcano. Vesuvius is quiet for now, but history tells us that the longer it lies dormant, the more violent the next eruption will be. Since 1944, there has been no sign of activity. That is worrying, because the more inactive the Vesuvius is, the more violent the explosion is going to be. In recent years, its seismic activity has increased dramatically. Scientists believe that this may be the warning that once again Vesuvius will explode and produce massive pyroclastic flows. The result could be devastating. Think about part-time learning. Think the Open University. Call now on 0800 733 766. Think about the unbelievable sense of achievement. Think about the latest in computer communications. Think about the freedom to study and still do your job. Think about your own personal tutor and making new friends. Think about achieving your potential. Think part-time learning. Think the Open University. Call now on 0800 733 766 for your free prospectus. Do it now. Thousands of kids have gone dance crazy with Wow! Let's Dance! Volume 5 of our Smash It! video series brings you the best moves yet to help you dance like your favourite pop stars. We show you all the steps and all the words to 10 sensational pop hits. Kids who like singing and dancing will love Wow! Let's Dance! Confused about your pension options? Then call for the government's impartial guide. I like to keep my body running like clockwork. That's where Bioactivia from Danon helps. It's a delicious tasting bio yogurt with a unique culture that eaten every day helps me feel good. And when you feel good on the inside, it shows on the outside. Bioactivia. Mmm, Danon. The new BMW.
BMW Compact. With rear wheel drive and near perfect balance. Without them, it just wouldn't corner like a BMW. In our next test, we will use sensory deprivation to demonstrate the superb softness of Nouvelle, the luxury toilet tissue made from recycled paper. It's very soft. Uh, and what about the next one? It's lovely. That's not what you'd expect from recycled paper. Not at all. Softer seven Nouvelle toilet tissue. If you're not completely happy with its softness, they'll give you your money back. Take the Nouvelle softness challenge for yourself. This car was traveling at 35 miles per hour. Had it been traveling at 30, it would have stopped here. Think, slow down. The spirit, the camaraderie, the blackout, the blitz, the looting, the prostitution, the rapes, the muggings, and the murders. Secret History investigates the darker side of the home front. Wartime crime after Volcano. This volcano has never stopped erupting. At over 10,000 feet, Mount Etna is Europe's largest volcano. Compared to Vesuvius, its magma originates at a much greater depth, perhaps as deep as 60 miles below the surface. In recent years, its summit craters have been throwing out huge bombs of lava. Mount Etna is located on the largest island in the Mediterranean. Sicily. Like Vesuvius, it's surrounded by crowded cities and towns with more than one million people. When volcano hunters John Seach and Jeff Mackley heard that huge eruptions were predicted, they traveled around the world to get close to the action. Hey, take a look at Boca Nueva. It's changed a bit from last year. Yeah, it's just playing smoke rings like this. I think the main focus of this visit is the southeast crater. On their hike up to the active craters, John and Jeff were privileged to witness one of the rarest events in volcanology, Etna's giant smoke rings. Look at that one, Jeff. Can yeah. you see that on the left-hand side there's a small ring attached to the main ring? Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Sometimes they seem to go past a little bit of cloud and it seems to suck the cloud in like, just like a tornado. It's really amazing. only started forming in 1968 when a new summit crater appeared. Its vent is unusually narrow and each time gas escapes from the magma inside, Etna blows out its unique rings. Jeff, look at that. There's another one. That's three in three minutes. Just from looking up at them, how big do you think they are? It's pretty hard to tell without some sort of reference. Now I can measure them in relation to the size of the crater. The record's been almost 200 metres across. So what's that, about the size of a football field? More, twice the size of a football field. Etna is erupting every four or five days. John and Jeff are hoping to film the huge fountains of lava that are reported to have been gushing half a mile into the sky. What? I've really got to do is be set up and we're going to have to basically choreograph this whole thing in advance of exactly where we're going to be because we're only going to have maybe 30 seconds of filming outside before we have to run inside and take cover. 
For their first night, they select a disused cable car station as a safe place to camp. It's just one and a half miles from the active craters. At 5.30, the next morning, the whole building starts to shake. Okay, we just woke up this morning. It was the, um, the first signs of eruption we hear. There was a, a flank eruption from the right-hand side of the southeast crater. maybe 400 metres high. Uh, it's been going there for six minutes. It's still continuing, maybe this will go for 15 minutes if we're lucky. 1,000 feet above them, the bombs are pounding another building, an abandoned observatory evacuated when the volcano became too active. Check out that rain of bombs behind the hut. So how big are those rocks? There's just huge rocks hitting the hut. About the size of buses. Oh, it's just fantastic. I've really got to be in that hut. Oh, you're framing the hut with the... Uh, I'm framing the hut close up, full frame. It's just the whole sky is filled with beautiful rocks. It's incredible. We're going to get uh, we're going to get cinders falling oh, on us. A England. huge rock just landed near the hut. It looked like the size of a bus. It bounced in the air. Well, this plume's now overhead, so any minute we're going to be covered in cinders. But here we go. Here we go. Yep. Yeah. Oh, look, this huge rock's landing. Oh, oh, come on, go. We're going to go. Go, 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 go. Okay. Inside. Hey, come on, Jeff. Come on. We're being hit by rocks. I'm standing in a real bomb zone. We've had this, this sixth eruption of. We had the 60th of Mount Etna in four and a half months. We woke up this morning to see some smoke coming out of the right flank of the southeast crane. That's been hit in the back by a baseball zone. Oh, wow. This is the bomb that hit me after it shattered on my back. That's what's left. It was about four times that size when it hit. I might carry that if you like. Meters. The tourist bus is going to 2,700 metres. So if this eruption had happened two hours later, there could have been hundreds of tourists all swarming around this area. It's beautiful. And there would have been accidents without a doubt. So I think we're really lucky that there are not people walking around this area. Because the tourist doesn't come with a hat. And this just could have been a disaster. After 15 minutes, the eruption dies down and the bombs stop falling. After each eruption, there's a period of calm while the magma chambers four miles below the volcano refill. For the next eruption, John and Jeff want to get even closer, so they climb up to the observatory they've just filmed being pounded with huge bombs. This is a really interesting section. Now, we're directly in line with the vents, so any large bombs will hit this area. But this takes us down into the, into the basement part. And this will be the most safe part. It's about 20 feet underground. Solid concrete. 
There's been a lava flow from three months ago that's run up against the wall here. It's a huge lava flow that, that's run up to the roof of the building. So in fact this has provided extra, extra protection for us. So that cellar part will be the most stable and safe in a um, catastrophic eruption. Possibly even a pyroclastic flow we could survive down in this cellar. Okay, we'll continue our tour of the basement, which may or may not become our tomb. As you can see, it's rather dilapidated. Probably was a boiler room at some point in time. And uh, this here is, uh, this could be our home uh, for several weeks if we get caught by a big eruption and buried. So we've basically got water, we need water to survive and uh, tins of food with tear tab lids so we can actually open them and uh, I'm afraid that's it so uh, we hope not to have to use this but we've got to prepare for all eventualities and uh, we hope this isn't one of them we'll just see what happens in the next two days we're counting down to zero Friday do you think John Friday will be the day of chaos Friday's the day Excellent. Thursday, one day earlier than expected, John Seach and Jeff Mackley are in touch by mobile phone with a local prediction centre. Southeast Crater has reactivated in the past 45 minutes. We've just received a phone call from the volcanologist, volcanologist to say that they've received an increase in seismic activity in the past 10 minutes. So we're expecting the major eruption to occur within the next hour. Etna is one of the most closely monitored volcanoes in the world. It's covered with seismic sensors. Within minutes of receiving the call, Jeff and John were filming the start of one of Etna's biggest eruptions for 2,000 years. Etna's magma is full of gas bubbles. When they escape into the atmosphere, they explode, throwing giant slabs of lava high above the vent. Whoa, look at that! A whole oh, of lava bombs just falling all across the flanks. It's incredible. That's an unbelievable sight. The, I can feel the, the heat of the lava through this visor. beautiful sights I've ever seen. Whoa, there's huge bombs the size of cars now falling down the flank of the volcano. Oh, that's just a beautiful spectacle. That's unbelievable. Lava is now fountaining about 300, 400 metres into the sky. As the pressure builds deep below the volcano, a fountain of liquid rock at over 1,200 degrees shoots over half a mile into the air, more than one million tons a minute. Surely this is one of nature's greatest spectacles. This is fantastic. Oh, unbelievable. I just, I just haven't got the words to explain what's going on.
I can't believe it. This, we've waited so long to see something like this. All my life I wanted to see such a spectacle. It's just an incredible sight. It's something that I'll never forget. We've waited a long time to get such a view. And Jeff's got a smile on his face. It's from one ear to the other. He's just, he can't believe it. The two volcanologists were extremely lucky. Strong wind carried the ash and debris away from them. They could stand their ground and watch the greatest show on Earth.